Good afternoon. I am so happy to be here today. It is Gary Morris from the Level Up series. I have just a remarkable guest today. And to say that I am beyond excited would be an understatement. This individual has had a meaningful impact in the lives of millions of entrepreneurs around the world. Michael Gerber, New York Times, mega best-selling author of The E-Myth Revisited, along with 20 more books on leadership, on management for entrepreneurs, has been on that top seller's top of the uh, heap for more than two decades. His books and lectures have been translated into 29 languages. Uh, they are part of the business curriculum in 118 universities, and they have been sold in more than 145 countries worldwide. Michael Gerber was named the all-time small business author by the Wall Street Journal. He has been named the world's, the world's number one small business guru by Inc. Magazine. Today, Michael currently lives in San Marcos, California with his beautiful wife, Luz. They have three daughters and five grandchildren. When he started out on this journey in 1977, his mission was to transform the state of small businesses worldwide. Michael has more than done that over more than 40 years of painstaking hard work. Michael, good afternoon. Welcome. And thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here, Gary. Thank you. Michael, wow, this has just been an absolute love affair. And you really have uh, delivered on what you set out to do so many years ago. And, you know, your mission is still resonating today. Um, I'd like to maybe go back to the, the very beginning and jump right in. It all started with a myth something that you coined as the e-myth, the entrepreneurial myth. Tell us what that myth was. Well, the myth was that um, everybody who starts their own business is an entrepreneur, and it's just not true. Uh, entrepreneurs create companies that work uh, primarily without them, and small business owners create a business to give them a job. So small business owners go to work in their business, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, busy, 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 and completely miss the point that's so crucial to the success of any business anywhere on the face of the planet. And that is the business must work of its own systemically to produce a significant result that enables it to grow, 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 grow. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because you see so many, you know, entrepreneurs, small business owners that are out there and what they thought they were creating and building uh, has actually turned into a pool of uh, disappointment. Uh, they, they, in fact, you know, haven't built something that is creating for them. They have built something that requires them to work 12 hours a day, you know, weekends and often with little or no holidays. And what they thought they were, you know, going to be building is remarkably different. And, and the main reason for that is because a lot of them think that because they were very good at their business, they were a technician, they were a good painter, they're a good mortgage professional, they just assumed that they would be a good business owner in the business, right, of, you know, generating uh, mortgage loans. Well, they, they started the business for the very wrong reason. They started the business to get rid of the boss. Right. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly they became one, and now they're working for a lunatic. But the problem is they've created a job, not a business, yeah. a job that depends upon them. So I can repeat it, and repeat it, and repeat it, and repeat it. And anybody and everybody who is self-employed or the beginning of a very small company, which is me and maybe Mary and John, um, must hear me in this, that in order for everything to change, your mind has got to be changed. And the only way your mind is going to be changed, if you go to work on your mind rather than in your mind, to see your mind 
as the true opportunity for transforming the state of where you are and what you do and how you do it. Yeah, I want to remind all of our uh, viewers and listeners today that, uh, like always, we're going to be giving away a whole bunch of Michael's books, uh, more than 50 of them. And the only prerequisite is you have to tag us or make a comment on social media. The hashtag we're leaving, uh, we're using today is the hashtag uh, level up. But also please tag me on any of my social media channels, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, etc., And we'll make sure that we get this book off. Listen, I'm going to say one thing to everyone listening in right now. If you haven't read Michael's books, if you haven't read the E-Myth or the E-Myth Revisited uh, or this you know, new book that we're going to be talking about, uh, start with the E-Myth. It is absolutely incredible. It is a must read. It will change the way you do business from this day going forward. And you will never, ever you know, be the same. So, Michael, so let's talk about um, this. So in your in the original book, in all the books, actually, you speak of the technician, you speak of the entrepreneur and you speak of the manager. Can you speak to us and just touch bases on these three roles and explain the differences? Well, absolutely. The technician is the doer, um, the producer. Um, right now, we're technicians. We're doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. I'm talking, you're talking, we're doing this, we're having an interview with each other. Um, we're technicians, we're doing the work. Everybody knows what that means. So in a financial services firm, a, a financial advisor is a technician. Um, in a um, chiropractic firm, the chiropractor is a technician, as well as his or her assistant, as well as um, other technicians inside the company, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing the work that needs to be done. But all of that needs to be managed because otherwise each technician inside of that chiropractic firm or each technician inside of that financial services firm is doing their own thing, their own way for what they perceive to be the right reason. Understanding now, if you're working with a large growing firm, and let's say there are 20, 30, 50 financial advisors, chiropractors, um, landscape designers, whatever, inside that firm, and each and every one of them is doing their own thing, the company itself is in chaos. So in that case, a management system is absolutely critical not only to prevent that chaos, right. but to manage the system through which one begins to create uniformity, unanimity within that firm that enables it to say, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get that. Yeah, fascinating. You know, one of the quotes that I read that you said, we want our customers to walk into a completely different world than what they are currently used to or came from in the past. And in order to do that, we have to map out every single step of the process. And the example that you gave in this quote was the customer that has walked into a retail store and the the staff member says, hi, can I help you? The customer says, no, thank you. I am busy. I'm just looking. And, and your question was, how could we change that so that we had a different experience? We had a different dialogue. And that is obviously just, you know, what you speak of when you're talking about systems. Absolutely. And, and you just struck that very resonant chord because how can I help you? You hear that everywhere and it's absolutely the wrong question so hear me who is it that's managing that process or even more important who is the entrepreneur the creator of that process who didn't see or question the intelligence the effectiveness of asking that particular question in that particular way there's another question that could be asked. Indeed, it may not even be a question. It simply might be an invitation. Hi, I'm Michael. I'd love to show you something because you're here today. You won't believe this. Yeah. And suddenly 
we have an invitation to show them something that we prepare to show everyone who comes to our store today. Wow, what a difference. And it's something that once you actually systemize and map out, you know, every single process in your business, you're mapping it out so that it is replicatable thousands and thousands and thousands of times over. A big business is a small business with systems and just more customers. Absolutely. A big business is a small business that does everything the right way. Right. Absolutely. So, okay. Michael, then. So what would you, all these years, you know, of doing this and speaking to thousands of entrepreneurs and business owners worldwide, and you maybe can't sum it up in, you know, in a sentence or not, but what do you see is the biggest mistake that, you know, small business owners typically make? Well, the biggest mistake they make is going into business. Okay. <laughs> So, so hear me, the reality is that last year, this is before the pandemic, before COVID, last year, there are roughly uh, half a million small companies that shut down for good. Mm -hmm. The year before that, the very same. The year before that, the very same. In short, before the pandemic, there was a pandemic, and that pandemic was and is the pandemic of business failure. They shouldn't have gone business in the first place without an absolutely clear understanding of what they're setting themselves up to do. So starting it right is the most critical step in the process of doing business right. And I'm suggesting that every single person on the planet, I'm not talking now of people who already have gone into business, that's for sure. I'm talking about every single person on the planet who is going to deal with an economic development question because every single one of us have one. We must live an economically um, effective life. Mm -hmm must begin to look at the difference between what I say when I say going to work on your life as opposed to simply going to work in your life. The difference is just meteoric right. in size. Yeah, well, I mean, the difference is, you know, that you speak about so frequently is that when you're working in your business, you're a technician, you're doing the work. And often you look at your business and you go, oh, this is not working out for me. I'm working way harder than I can. I'm I'm the only breadwinner in this business. If I wasn't here, I wouldn't have a business. But yet, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, which is the very definition of insanity. Here's the good news for anyone on this call today, because a lot of you have your own businesses. Today is a fresh today. Today is a brand new set of downs. You have 24 hours ahead of you right now and you can change things so that they'll never ever be the same. And, you know, Michael has identified a whole bunch of things that we're going to talk about. But the one thing that resonated with me is he identified five key skills that every business owner should master. And that's not the technician. That's not the work right now. So, Michael, I'm going to just list these five one at a time, these five key skills. And I would love your comment uh, on each one. So the first key skill that every business owner should master is concentration. And and Gary, let me say that I'm gonna change a word. Please. You said key skills. Yeah. These aren't key skills, they're essential skills. Perfect. These are essential skills for life. So the first yes is concentration. And that means essentially, be here now. It means one's ability to focus one's attention here now. Um, it's something that one must practice in order to develop the capability to concentrate. Very few people know how. Very few people, in fact, actually do concentrate. They're almost always distracted by one thing or another. The shiny penny, the busy, 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 the what I want, the what I don't, and on and on and on and on. So concentration is the fundamental 
first skill. And hear me as well, Gary, these skills are a part of a process. So it's skill number one, skill number two, skill number three, four, five. It's a process. The first and most essential skill, as you've said, is concentration. So that's number one. Yeah. So uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's funny, especially those of us that are a little bit older that haven't, you know, have just kind of found our way and the wind is pushing us in the direction that we go. It's very hard. It's like studying for a university, of course, again, it's very hard to get yourself back into the habit of, you know, turning off of all, you know, technologies around you and learning how to concentrate again. The second essential skill that you said every business owner must master is the discrimination to the ability to, to discriminate what is most important. Absolutely. Because if you're going to concentrate, now you're going to concentrate on what you're going to concentrate on something you choose to concentrate on. And that requires the ability to discriminate, to choose between this or that. And so now that I have the ability to focus my attention, now the question is, so what do I focus my attention on? So discrimination elects for me to choose this to focus my attention on. You can see that honing, that focusing, that's so critical in the personal development of any human being, in the business development of any enterprise. Focus focus, focus on this. Mm. And suddenly there's a deep, deep purpose mm. associated with everything I do. Yeah. Love it. Makes a lot of sense. So before we go on to the third essential skill, I want to just make a comment. So if you're on this call right now and you're going, okay, I got it. I'm going to learn how to concentrate. And then I'm going to uh, discriminate on what's most important for me to study and focus on. It would be my suggestion. And Michael, I'll see if you agree with me. If you're making a short list right now of where you start, it would be on lead generation, lead conversion, and customer fulfillment. Because if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Would you agree or disagree? I disagree. Okay. Please, uh, <laughs> please, please uh, tell us the way it is because I can learn so much from you. And let me explain why I would disagree. Uh, because the process of business development is just that, a process. I call it, and we have defined it and focused upon it as eight very critical steps. Um, the dream, the vision, the purpose, the mission, the job, the practice, the business, the enterprise. In Beyond the E-Myth, you saw I call it the evolution of an enterprise from a company of one to a company of 1,000. I'm essentially saying that in order for your enterprise to grow, you need to focus on that enterprise from the very beginning, step by step by step with this statement, I have a dream. With this statement, I have a vision. With this statement, I have a purpose. With this statement, I have a mission. I have a dream. I have a vision. I have a purpose. I have a mission. So now if we're going to focus our attention on my dream, we have to ask the question, so what is a dream? When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream, and if you listen to Dr. Martin Luther King speak his dream, you get a deep, 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 deep sense of how important that dream is. A dream, your dream, is the great result you intend to produce. Right. In our case, in my case, way back then in 1977, when we formulated our very first business development firm, which then was called the Michael Thomas Corporation. Our dream was to transform the state of small business worldwide. Right. Our vision was to invent the McDonald's of small business consulting services. Our purpose was that every small business owner who took us seriously could be as successful as a McDonald's franchisee. And our mission was that in order for 
the dream, vision, and purpose to become a reality, we had to invent the business development system that would make that possible. So you can begin to see how the evolution of the enterprise began. And I'm saying that it was identically the same at Apple, identically the same at Microsoft, identically the same at Facebook, identically the same at every expanded enterprise, whether or not they thought dream, vision, purpose, and mission, that's effectively what they had to do. And it began with concentration, discrimination, the third organization. Organization. Yeah. And then, innovation and then communication. Right. So we'll jump back to those five key skills. We've done the concentration, discrimination. Organization is turning chaos into organization. Organization is simply turning chaos into order. Right. Turning order. chaos into order. Nothing grows without order. Order is paramount mm -hmm. to a successful operating company. Order is absolutely paramount to a successful operating entrepreneur. So order within your life is critical. You don't just get it. You got to learn to produce it. And so I developed the skill of organization with intent, concentration, discrimination, organization. And you can begin to feel the pieces coming together within me, who is to be the leader of this organization, which is now becoming organized. Got her. And the fourth key essential skill, once you have concentration, discrimination, organization is innovation, the ability to innovate, to always look to your business and try to make it better, always to improve it. Innovation, 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 the best way, the best way, the best way, the best way. But you understand it's not the very best way because none of us know what the very best way is. All we know is and can know is what the better way is. Mm -hmm. So the better way than where we are, the better way than where we are, the better way than we're continuously improving upon working on the system by which we do what we do here to improve that system by which we do what we do here, to expand our ability to touch the hearts of the people we're doing this for, our clients, our customers, our employees, our friends, our associates, our family, our, our community, and on and on and on. And Michael, I think um, when you talk about innovation, just to break it down into micro steps, um, I think you mean every single area of your business, you know, how you answer the phone, how you communicate, your speed of response, things that seem trivial and incident and, and non-consequential, uh, you know, are areas that are easy to innovate and to improve on. And I think the first step is just identifying that and working through those changes, correct? Absolutely. Well, we started out this conversation with uh, how can I help you? Um, there's nothing too small in your company. There's nothing too insignificant in your company. There's nothing too small in your life that you can't and shouldn't and must pay attention to it because it's how all of those small pieces come together, this one and that one and this one and that one, to evolve into the operating system that defines who your company is. Apple is Apple. Apple isn't any other company other than Apple. Apple has its own way of being and doing who they are. Apple is its own distinct personality, its mm -hmm. own distinct persona. Now hear me, I'm not working for Apple. I'm simply suggesting to you that you can name any company yeah. on the planet who has successfully exceeded expectations of anyone on the planet. And you'll find what I'm speaking about true inside of that company. Yeah. And let's take, you know, I know you're a huge fan of obviously Ray Kroc and McDonald's. I mean, the most successful food service company in the world run by 17 year olds. <laughs> Think about it. Right? It's <laughs> the most successful small business in the world. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah, it's crazy. They don't sell anything unique. Yeah. A hamburger, french fries, and a milkshake. Yeah. I mean, 
They're ordinary commodities until Ray Kroc put his handle on them. And they suddenly became a Big Mac. They suddenly became his fries, nobody else's fries. Right. Because every single component of McDonald's has been thought through, thought through, thought through, created through in order to produce an integrated result by every single person who comes into that store. Yeah, absolutely. And the fifth point, the fifth key essential skill, and I've been saying this, you know, forever, The, in my opinion, you know, you look at any troubled business and so much of it uh, is around communication, the ability to uh, communicate solves most problems. So your number five essential skill is communication. We got to talk. We've got to communicate visually, emotionally, functionally, financially. We have to tell our story. We have to know what that story is. We have to create that story. We have to be that story. In reality, we have to become that story because we'll never be that story to the degree we fail to work on ourselves as we invent that story. So effectively, every great story is the product of this process I'm talking about. Concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation, communication. Every single one of you here, every single one of you here lead an economic life. I'm suggesting it's not just an economic life, it's an economic development life. And to the degree you're engaged in an economic development life, you need to apply yourself differently than the vast majority of people on the planet do. Because until you do, or let me say even worse, unless you do, you'll absolutely not understand a word that Gary and I have been sharing with you. Until you do, unless you do, you will not understand a word that Gary and I have been sharing with you. That is so painful for me. Now reaching my age of 84 and knowing I've been doing this work for 40 plus years on this planet with the intent to transform the state of small business worldwide, which required us to transform the state of entrepreneurship worldwide, which the product of in total is the transformation of economic development in the world, worldwide. Get that. Wow. Is that big or is it not? Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Um, Michael, I'm going to just ask you a question that I believe I know the answer to already, but I want to ask it because I know a lot of people are thinking, what would you say to the small business owner right now listening to this that says, yeah, yeah, I know I have to take all these essential steps and, and, and work on these essential skills and I have to map out and systemize every step of my business so that it's replicatable over and over and over thousands of times, but I can't because I'm too busy servicing my clients. Well, then shut your doors. Right. Go work for somebody else. It's that very, very simple. Just shut your doors. Um, because you won't be here. It won't work. It can't work. As in fact, millions upon millions upon millions of your peers have testified over the years. The greatest pandemic in our world is the pandemic of failure. Outright failure. The outright failure of people attempting to live a productive life, a joyful life, and not finding the key to doing it. Hear me, you have just heard a, a, a window, a view into a key to living a productive, joyful, extraordinarily, exceptionally creative life. That's possible for you, but you have to let go of everything you believe to be true in order to begin it with, as I've said countless times, a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. Mm. You have to begin as a beginner. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what experience you've got. I don't care what your skills you believe you have. I don't care what you think you wanna do or what you don't. 
absolutely the only step in this process that will enable you to begin this process in more than just a productive way is to empty your mind of all of the beliefs you have about work, what works, why it works, how it works, and what to do in order to transform the state of what you do right now. It's possible for every single one of you and every person you know on the planet. So get that, know that, we've done that, we're doing that, and it can be done for you. Yeah, beautifully said. You know, I've often said to people, uh, you know, you don't have a business, you have a job and you're not a leader, you're a manager. And unfortunately, that's the way unless people have that beginner's mind and they're willing to do the hard work. I mean, being successful in business where your business serves you is excruciatingly, is, is excruciatingly hard. I mean, it's evenings and weekends, you know, in the beginning, it's making the, the, the sound investment in the areas that you don't know. One of the biggest holdbacks that I see in people is that they, they, they argue with themselves, right, and try to prove them right what they think they already know. If you don't have that beginner's mind, you don't realize that what you know might not be, you know, what you need to know, uh, then you'll never get there. You, you talked about Michael, uh, the eightfold path, the newest generation. And you went through some of it already. You said, Gary, start with your dream and then go to your vision and then go to your purpose and then go to your mission. Once we've identified our dream and our vision for the business that we're creating and the purpose that we want it to provide. And we've boiled it down to our mission. There's uh, a few other uh, steps. The next step was your job and your client fulfillment system. Can you speak to us about that, please? I understand first about the, you might say the, the first step in this process. I have a dream, a vision, a purpose, and a mission. Um, that is in fact, the, 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 the series of steps that need to be taken in order to establish a platform upon which you're going to grow a company. And I'm saying a company of one, which is effectively what all small companies are when they begin, a company of one. It's you and the job you've created for yourself. You're a financial advisor. You're doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. Busy, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have a dream, I have a vision, I have a purpose, and I have a mission for what I'm setting out to create. The first step in that creation is what we call the job. And the job really is the client fulfillment system of the company you're setting out to create. And the client fulfillment system is just that, the process through which you deliver the result that you are committed to produce as stated eloquently in your dream, in your vision, in your purpose, in your mission. So the job, the job, the job, the job is the, is the, the, the result you're intending to produce. It's the client fulfillment system you're setting out to create. And it's literally that a system by which that technician that financial advisor is going to do what that financial advisor is intending to do with the intent of growing the company that does it. So hear me, you're building from first scratch right. the system by which your financial services fulfillment firm right. fulfills its commitment to its clients. The second step is the practice. Now, what's the practice? Well, the practice is the lead generation and lead conversion system that must be exercised in order for you to have clients mm -hmm. to deliver your client fulfillment system to. But the practice is even more than that, Gary. The practice is what I call your franchise prototype. It's the three-legged stool, lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment, the lead generation system, the lead conversion system, and the client fulfillment system, your franchise prototype, turnkey. It's like the McDonald's store right. in Des Plaines, Illinois. 
It's the very first store that Ray Kroc created. The system in that store had to be tested and validated and improved upon and improved upon before Ray Kroc would say, now we're going to open store number two. Right. Identically the same with this financial services firm that we're talking about. Before I'm going to bring aboard a second financial planner, financial advisor, utilizing the financial system that we have just designed in our client fulfillment center, the very first thing we must do is to turn key. That means document. That means test and validate the systems we've created to generate leads, to generate clients, and to fulfill our promises to them. The prototype. Mm -hmm. That's the practice. Yeah, well, thank you. I, you know what? I feel much better because I hit the three on the head when I said lead, jet, lead, conversion, and fulfillment, but I just put them ahead of the dream, the vision, the purpose, and the mission. So I was yeah. there for the customer, but uh, I hadn't set the foundation correctly. So thank you, Michael, for uh, that. I want to, um, you know, I came across something that I absolutely love that I'm I'm going to, there's 10. It's Michael Gerber's 10 rules for success. And I'm going to read you each rule. I love them because I just thought they resonated so well. Uh, and I will I would ask for a comment on each one. So here is Michael Gerber's, the small business guru, 10 rules for success. His first rule is find a way to differentiate yourself. Michael, do you want to comment on that? Well, absolutely. Um, in short, we're either a commodity or we're a product. A commodity means doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. Um, no difference there. Uh, a product means completely uniquely doing what we do. In short, we own this space. That's what differentiation means. We own this space. You have to design it in order to own it. You have to develop it in order to own it. You need to define it in order to own it and you need to build it out to the point where you can replicate it in order to scale it. So absolutely critical. This defining your role in the world is absolutely fundamentally perfect, purposefully important, significantly so for the, the design and creation of a small company. Yeah, I love it. The second uh, one that really resonated with me is have the right, or sorry, yeah, have the right mindset. Well, the mindset we've talked about, concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation, communication. I'm here to grow a company, to grow, to scale. I'm here to create an enterprise that will produce immense and important meaning in the world. I'm here to do important work. That's the mindset. That's the mindset. Get out of the technician's mindset, guys, where you know what you're doing all the work and go beyond that. The third thing, uh, which is beautiful, everything begins right now. Nothing frustrates me more. Well, okay, I'll think about this. We'll have another meeting in two weeks. We'll have another meeting in two weeks. We'll talk about it. We burned half a year without starting. Like we can start right now today, the minute we finish this podcast. So talk to us about everything begins right now in Michael Gerber's mind. Everything begins right now because there is no past and there is no future. Life is now. It's the only place you can find it other than in your imagination and in your memory. So hear me, this is not about what I remember. This is not about what I imagine. This is about my experience right now. And you're having one right now. But if you're not here right now, the experience you have is either the past in memory or in the future in imagination, come home, be here, absolutely sacrosanct for all of us. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, number four, and we talked about this a lot, but we'll just uh, touch on it. The system is the solution. Well, we've already proven that the system is the solution. McDonald's is the system. Apple is the system. Microsoft is the system. Facebook is a system. Every great company is a system. If it isn't a system, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring that back to all of our uh, mortgage professionals out there on this call right now. We have a lot of, you know, we have the, the top mortgage professionals in the Canadian, um, you know, financial landscape. 
and you have all developed a system, whether you know it or not, how you answer the phone, the speed of re re uh, uh, response, what you say to the actual customer, the documents that you send them, how you follow up, how you database them is a system. Now you have to actually map out that system, have that beginner's mind, look at ways to improve it, document it. And then when you want to build your team so that you can earn income off the production of others, you're going to make sure they're following that system because Absolutely. you're a top performer because you have already developed the system. You haven't mapped it out is the difference. Absolutely. You know, one of the key problems um, beyond the technician doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, is the manager doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. In short, the vast majority of managers on this planet are not operating through the use of profoundly effective management system. They don't have one. They're simply technicians with the title of manager, just like uh, 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 small business owners are technicians with the title of owner, with the title of entrepreneur. The title doesn't cut it, right. the system does. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number five, uh, I also love this one because it, it just resonates uh, so deeply. Don't listen to the little man. Person in your head, you can't do that. Even if you could do that, why would you do that? You're wrong. You can make more money doing this. You're taking advice from somebody who's never done it or been there. Do not listen to the little man. Michael? Yeah. Well, there was a great master by the name of Gurdjieff. Um, Gurdjieff said, we're not one eye. We're a whole subset of little eyes. And every single time one of those little eyes is triggered, he or she says, I with a capital I, as though they are I, but they're not. <laughs> now you have to hear that because your life is populated by little eyes, each of whom has their own individual and highly personalized addiction. Every single one of them has an addiction. Every single one of them is addicted to a way of being, a way of thinking, a way of fearing, a way of wanting, et cetera, and so forth. You must become familiar with all of those eyes. Oh, that's John again. Oh, that's John again. Oh, that's John again. Oh, that's Judy again. Oh, that's Judy again. You've got to identify them because if you can identify them when they show up, you're suddenly doing what we spoke about earlier, concentrating discriminating, organizing, with the capability of innovating, and obviously communicating with great effectiveness. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Uh, 10 Rules for Success by Michael Gerber. Uh, number six is get it right at the very start. <laughs> yes, your job isn't just to keep doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. Your job is to get it right. Unless we repeat ourselves um, too many times here, you got to work on it if you're ever going to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Number seven, start for the right reasons. We talked about so many people, just their dream of starting their own business is to get rid of the boss. I want to be self-employed. I want to make the decision. And unless you've thought that through and done the hard work and mapped out the vision you know that we spoke about today, uh, you are doomed for failure. So uh, start for the right reason. Any comments on that, Michael? Well, I, I just want, you know, when, when you say that, Gary, that you're doomed to failure, and I've said that in any number of ways uh, while we've been here, um, understand when we say that that's true. Hear me, that's not just something we're making up. That's not just our point of view. It's true. Mm -hmm. To the degree you fail, determine what your primary aim is in life to the degree you fail to do the work of discovering what your dream, your vision, your purpose, and your mission are, you will waste your time day after day, after day, after day, going down an infinite range of directions and never coming home. And you'll get to be my age at 84. And you'll say, what in the hell have I been doing all this time? And is it? I assure you, anyone on this call, if they can wake up at 84 years old and be as sharp and witty and bright and charismatic and communicative as you are, 
it will be deemed a very successful life. So, I mean, oh my, and I mean that with all sincerity. Uh, number eight, which is probably the one out of your 10 that resonates the most with me. I mean, it really is, is the foundation of who I am. It's something that I've shared with all of our leadership team over and over and over. I try to share it, um, you know, as much as I possibly can. And that's to become an incredible student. Become an incredible student because what else are you going to be? In short, you're here in life for what? Six years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, and then you're gone. Hear me, you're here for this period of time and then you're gone. Mm. The question is, why are you here? In short, why were you created here? What is it that you're here to do? Who is it you're here to be? What is it you're here to learn? And if you accept the reality that this is our university, the university of our lives, and that the sole purpose of being here within our lives is to discover why we're here in our lives, then you'll understand that what Gary says, that to be a perennial student, learning, 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 and it starts inside you, not outside you. Mm -hmm. It starts by identifying that John, that Judy, that Jim, that Jerry, the ones who wake up in you, all the little eyes who wake up into you. And this one says, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to, to wake up and to see them and to be there with them. Suddenly learning the distinction between I as in I am, and him and her and him and her and him and her and all the little troublesome things that go on in our lives. Wow, what an extraordinary thing to learn. Yeah, it sure is. And it's funny because when you become a incredible student, you can't help it. All of a sudden, you know what? It just starts leaking out of you on osmosis. And without you even knowing it, you're starting to infect other people. And what you're learning is being transmitted to them. And I've often said before that, you know, you want to give your children, in my opinion, the greatest gift. Let them see you be a lifelong learner. And it's no different than what Michael's talking about, because when we become lifelong learners and when we're an incredible student, we start seeing the differences in our business but those around us that we need to support us in our business, we start to see their flame ignite and we start to see them become something and we've turned on the light for them. And it is incredible. And that is my, you know, my opinion is how you can really get that team rowing in the same direction and fighting for a, for a, for a common mission. And that's, you know, from a, from a leader's positions job to ignite the flame in, in others. So well said, Michael, thank you. Thank um, you. The next one I want to, um, to have you explain it. Cause I, I, I didn't, I don't understand it hundred percent truthfully, uh, but I'd like to know, don't put your entrepreneur spirit to sleep. What does that mean in your mind? Well, putting your entrepreneurial spirit to sleep would be essentially to believe that in fact, you've re, re, realized uh, why you're here. Um, you create something and then you stay with it. You create something and you never change it. You create something and it becomes an addiction to it. That's not being an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is a continuous living process. An entrepreneur is constantly, constantly growing. An entrepreneur is constantly looking upon what is true and what is not and attempting to figure out something about it that he couldn't see quite certainly in the moment that he saw it. So this is an adventure, yeah. folks, extraordinary adventure. So don't let your, in quotes, entrepreneur put you to sleep simply because he or she is unwilling to play this game to the degree that's possible for him or her to play this game, for you to play this game. Yeah, boy, that makes a lot of sense. And you know where that really resonates is that, you know, it's funny because even people who are actually doing quite well. They unfortunately fall to the prey of status quo and they go, well, I'm doing okay, but yet there's so much more available. And I often say that when you're doing well or successful is actually when you're most vulnerable. Would you agree with that, Michael? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. Right. When you're beginning to feel like 
I'm hanging on to it. I don't want to lose it. I got it. I had to work really, really hard to get it and I don't want to lose it. So I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it. Don't change me. Don't and on and on and on. You can begin to feel the rigidity that begins to step in and takes control of your life. It's that status quo that must be eradicated. Yeah. Status quo is the enemy of greatness. Right. And just because you think you've gotten to a certain way doesn't mean there's not a lot long, a long way to go. So, uh, wow, that was uh, really powerful. Take, I it, last take it from me at 84. Oh, yeah. Take it from me. I have so much to learn yet. That is and so when you understand that there's so much to learn yet, that is so let go of all of those inhibitions to learning. Yeah, that is absolutely just such a life lesson right there. Uh, and then the last number 10 of Michael Gerber's Rules for Success, and we've uh, talked about this uh, infinitely today, but work on your business uh, rather than in your business. Find time to look from the outside, looking in and improve every process, every system and every step of the business. Any additional comments you want to make to that, Michael? Well, you got it. We've been talking about it all this time. Work on it. That means separate yourself from it. In order to work on it, you need to rise above it so you can see beneath you what in fact is going on you need to be able to gain that measure of distance from the reality of it in order for you to be able to appreciate or understand or evaluate what in quotes the reality of it is until you get that distance you're addicted to it until you get that distance you lose any ability whatsoever to be separate from it and that separation is critical, absolutely critical. Yeah, it's, um, you know, my mind is just going, it's, there's so much, I just can't wait to get off this and make my list of the things that I want to, you know, continue to work on. And it's just such an honor, Michael, to see you after, you know, 40 some odd years, you know, uh, being the 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 top in your field in the world, and it started with with your own mission. I can't tell you how grateful we are to have you, Michael. Talking about grateful, here's a personal question for you, and everyone describes it differently. But what does Michael Gerber define as greatness? What what do you sit back and go, okay, I'm 84. Like, have I, you know, like, what is greatness to you, and when do you know whether or not you've achieved it? Well, greatness to me is to produce a profound impact um, on the world. And so the dream that inspired me starting way back at the very beginning to transform the state of small business worldwide, were I to be able to achieve that result, I would achieve a level of greatness by the very fact of it. So greatness doesn't come from my own personality. Greatness comes from my determination to exceed my limitations by discovering what I perceive to be impossible to do. And through the thick and thin of it, actually discovering the way to do it. To me, that's what greatness is. The act of it and the fact of it, to discover it, whole hog plus the postage, is just beyond anything measurable. It is that one thing that I believe every one of us are here to pursue, whatever that might be. Amen, Mr. Gerber. That might have been the best answer that I recall receiving on on what is greatness and i think it was fitting that your your chime that goes off every hour was chiming in the background it was incredibly uh surreal thank you for for sharing with us today um michael we on behalf of all of our uh listeners and viewers and people who have tuned into the podcast um i can't tell you how incredibly 
humbled I am to have had you as my guest today and how grateful I am for your works over the years. I realized today that you have some some recent work uh, in the last few years that I haven't read that I will get right on to reading. Um, but I, I hope to, I'm going to stay on with you after this call is over, but I, I hope to have you back many, many more times. You are an absolute gift to entrepreneurs. You're a gift to not only small business, you're a gift to any business, any size. And, and, and to that comment, on Facebook right in front of us. You are a beautiful human being, Mr. Gerber. So on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A delight being here. And um, I would just love for every single one of the folks who've joined us and will join us in the future to approach their lives in the way that we described here, because it is the secret underlying all of the stuff that is sent your way in so many different manners and forms to truly transform the state of your life right here, right now. Thank you. My delight. Yeah, it was, uh, it was wonderful to, uh, to our sponsor, uh, first Canadian title. Thank you for being a huge part of our business to, uh, all the people in the Canadian finance space that continue to turn into these level up calls. Uh, thank you. You make us incredibly proud. Uh, we're so grateful to have you part of our company and our organization. Uh, and thank you to, uh, David, our producer and uh, all the team that put these incredible level up series, uh, together. Um, with that, we will sign off, uh, guys, we have Robin Sharma coming in January. Really, really super happy to have Robin. Michael, we are going to speak offline. We're going to stay on here. Uh, can't wait to uh, find ways to do more together. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Have a great afternoon.